I want to thank you for coming out and braving the elements on this unseasonably chilly spring morning as we embark to unveil the marker for Miss Nanny Helen Burroughs. This is the site of the former Douglas Building, this Greyhound bus station, this site here, where the women's industrial club she founded met and held classes to train and prepare black women to enter and advance in the workforce in the early 1900s. With classes both day and night in business, office skills, millinery, dressmaking, and domestic work, the women gained skills necessary to train and support themselves and their families with dignity. They sold cakes and pies and lunches to black downtown office workers in order to support the classes. And although initially not charging for the classes, she eventually was convinced to charge 10 cents a week for those who could afford it, for those who couldn't, just a penny. These classes served as the prototype or training ground for the schools she eventually opened and that she had dreamed about for many years in Washington, D.C. in 1909, the National Training School for Women and Girls. Due to the many financial contributions of black folks, especially black women from all across the country. But this block also has special meaning for me because just across the street at 719 West Walnut was the site where my father opened his first medical practice when he and my mother moved to Louisville in 1947 which was still the heart of the black business and entertainment district. Just think about what was going on over 100 years ago. This was a thriving community, thriving. And if you think about the giants from the early 1900s to the mid 1900s, certain names of leaders come to mind. Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mary McLeod Bethune, Booker T. Washington, W.W.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., just to name a few. Everyone has heard of them. But Nanny Burroughs, Helen Burroughs, who worked for so long, for 61 years, and fought right alongside them, her accomplishments and her name seems to have faded into the shadows of history. But Nanny Helen Burroughs will remain forgotten no more because today we speak her name. And we will all learn of her remarkable life and legacy in just a few minutes from our speakers, Dr. Kevin Cosby, and I'll be pitch hitting for our keynote speaker who was uh, fell ill today. But today is important because as my mentor, the late alderwoman Lois Morris would always say, you've got to know the history. Because too often certain people, certain politicians are attempting to downplay our history to erase our history and our contributions to this country. So I've been asked to share my mother's connections to Nellie Helen Burrow because she's the only person I knew who graduated from her school. Now I didn't grow up hearing or knowing anything about Miss Nanny Helen Burroughs. Unlike many of you, I imagine, who were raised in the Baptist church, I didn't hear her name until I found out years later that my mother had graduated from her school in 1942 before enrolling at Fisk. And after my mother died in 2013, I was going through her belongings, her writings, her journals, and I found out just how much Miss Burroughs had meant to her and how she had influenced her life and direction. Now, if any of you knew my mother, Ruth Booker Bryant, you remember her as an outspoken, intelligent, passionate warrior for social justice. But, thank you. But she was also artistic, sociable, generous, and stylish. I knew her as a loving mother and role model who worked for civil rights in the boardrooms and on the streets fighting for open housing in 1967. And in spite of being falsely accused of inciting to riot and a subsequent acquittal, she carried herself throughout this tumultuous period with grace, strength, and inner resolve. I later learned that the government had been monitoring Ms. Burroughs for years for her activism, but she never backed down. But I also knew my mother as a great cook who loved to bake and try new recipes, always had breakfast and dinner on the table for her four children and husband, 
a fabulous hostess who loved to redecorate her home and whose door was always open. And although she could afford to, and sometimes did, have people come in and help around the house and with the ironing and cooking, I can vividly recall many times seeing her on her hands and knees, scrubbing the kitchen floor, trying to reach what a mop couldn't, and using newspapers and a bucket to wash the windows at our home like it was no big deal. I was amazed. I wondered how she was able to balance her life and responsibility as a wife and homemaker duties with her community role and commitments in fighting for social change. I just assumed it was because of her home training from her parents and their influence. But I was also curious how my parents, her parents, had let their firstborn and oldest daughter leave home in Detroit as a high school student at 16 years old and go away to school. At first, I thought it must have been my grandfather who was a political activist in Detroit and always encouraged her to break from the crowd, dare to be different, and never submerge your identity. But the more I learned about my gra her grandmother, V.V. Kilgore, who lived two blocks down the street, I learned that she was around Miss Burrell's age and was a deeply religious woman, very active in the missionary society and president of the Wolverine Baptist State Convention and the Women's Department of Calvary Baptist District Convention. She regularly attended the women's conventions over the years where she must have heard Nanny Harlan Burrell speak and no doubt contributed to Ms. Burrell's fundraising efforts to build the National Training School for Women and Girls. It was probably her dream that her own granddaughter would attend her school, and she drafted a letter asking for her to be admitted. Now, that's the best face that I can put on the reason for her attending. But in a 1977 University of Louisville oral history interview transcript, she tells the real deal. She liked to have a lot of fun and to have a good time. But as her younger sister recently told me, one afternoon my mother and a girlfriend had skipped school and gone shopping at a department store in downtown Detroit. And just as she was leaving through the department store revolving door, her grandfather was coming in the same door. She wasn't sure if he had seen her or not, but she knew she was busted. She told the interviewers, so my parents took me out the last two years of high school and I was sent to Nanny Burrell's school in Washington, D.C., a private girls' high school. She said, Ms. Burroughs was a great black Baptist women's leader as president of the school and this was very good for me at this time in my life. As her father would often say, there's always a reason for something and the reason. So at a critical age of 16, she got on a train to Washington, D.C. A relative happened to be a chef on the train, and he made sure she had plenty to eat and sleeping accommodations, too. Now, Nanny Helen Burrell's school was a traditional high school with English, math, and a lot of Bible she said, and I had a great influence on her studying black history or Negro history as it was known at the time because it was part of the curriculum developed by Carter G. Woodson, her friend and the founder of Negro History Week. And on Sundays, she would attend the Howard Chapel where she was able to hear Dr. Howard Thurman deliver liberation theology sermons every week. She saw well-known black leaders such as Mary McLeod Bethune come to the campus. She recalled the excitement of President Roosevelt's inauguration, going regularly to the Smithsonian Institution and seeing black women dressed in gorgeous clothes and beautiful furs. All this made a great impression on her, nothing she had ever seen before in Detroit. Even though she knew it was probably out there, she hadn't seen that. But she knew that she wanted the best for her life. It was here when she decided that she wanted to do something important with her life. She said that the teachers talked to them about life 
and they really prepared them for life. They saw a potential in me. I didn't know it was there, but they saw something in me. I'd overhear them discussing me at the teacher's table about Miss Booker, what I was doing and what I had said, and that I was, I felt I was very well nurtured there. I always felt like a special person anyway, but she graduated at the top of her class and received a $50 check, which she said was a lot of money at the time. With the National Training School's emphasis on the three Bs, Bible, Bath, and Broom, she received a very balanced education, which increased her self-identity and self-confidence and reinforced the importance of studying history. And when she went to Fisk, she majored in history, minored in sociology, and that helped her influence her decision to become a substitute teacher in social studies here in Louisville. And in 1968, she helped co-found the Black Unity League of Kentucky, which worked to get black student unions on the college campuses and to get black history taught in our public schools. She wanted to interact with young people herself and share her love of history. Now, the domestic science department at Nanny Burrow School featured courses in homemaking, housekeeping, household administration, interior decorating, laundering, home nursing, management for matrons, directors of school dining rooms and dormitories. Her curriculum professionalized home, home economics as a female-led scientific field. In addition, they received instruction in the actual preparation and serving of food, cleaning of rooms, making of beds, and as well as principles of good conduct, manners, and dress. We all know many black women have for years worked as domestics for white families when other professions or occupations were closed off or unavailable. Nanny Helen Burroughs worked hard and long for the respect and professionalism of domestic workers. I think the Montgomery bus boycott, which ended after a year, ended when it did because white families were so inconvenienced by having to provide rides for their cooks and maids to their homes for that length of time. I'm sure many of us can recall taking home economics in junior high school and the pride we felt when we uh, made our first article of clothing that we could take home or the first meal we were able to prepare by ourselves. Practical lessons that served us well and would serve students today as well. It has been written that the National Training School gives personal attention to the entire life of the girls, health, manner, and character in mind. Its training is designed to make the students clear of vision, alert in action, modest in deportment, skillful of hand, and industrious in life. Young women are trained to preside over and maintain well-ordered homes. As character building is the chief aim of that school, the, get, the girls came under its influence and got a development in moral and spiritual stamina to support and enrich their academic training. Ms. Burroughs said, we make our girls believe in themselves and in their power to do anything that anybody else can do, be it ever so difficult. I can certainly say that can-do spirit got into my mother as a teen and everything she attempted and accomplished in her life. The importance of Nanny Helen Burroughs and the National Training School and its impact can't be overstated. Its lasting impression on my mother's young life and throughout her life reinforces to me the importance of good influences, role models, and exposure in shaping young lives. And the timeliness and importance of institutions like the Grace James Academy here and its purpose in educating young African-American girls of today to be the leaders of tomorrow is more important and timely than ever. As Horace Mann would say, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Thank you. And now I'd like to call up Allie Robick from the Kentucky Historical Society. Followed by Tina Ward Pugh, the Director of the Office for Women. Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Ali Robick, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Kentucky Historical Society, where I coordinate the Historical Marker Program. I want to thank you guys for being here today. This is our first historical marker dedication in a very long time due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is a really great turnout for us, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, the marker program has been around since 1949. It's over 70 years old, and we've got over 2,600 markers throughout the Commonwealth, including this one. And there's a marker in at least each county, so that's... Very, the Jefferson County is very well represented in the program. I want to thank the hard work of Tina Ward Pugh, Jeannie Potter, and Sherry Bryant Hamilton. I know this last year has not been easy, but their continued partnership is what makes this program so great. It's communities such as this that are so dedicated to commemorating their history that makes what I do, what we do at the Kentucky Historical Society so great. So I want to thank you guys again for coming out, and we're really excited to be here. And, and thank you also to the Kentucky Department of Transportation, who makes their, they make uh, this possible with their partnership, installing the marker for us and making sure that they are maintained. So thank you very much, and now I'll have Tina Ward Pugh come up. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. Um, it was my great honor uh, when I began working at the Office for Women three years ago to join an effort that the Fraser History Museum and the League of Women Voters uh, had begun uh, in preparation for last year, which was the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote, women's suffrage, uh, and the suffrage flag behind us, by the way, um, and the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so um, we formed a great partnership and had the support of a lot of other smaller agencies uh, around the community. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, some of the folks here today uh, have been a, a very integral part of that. Also want to thank Sherry, <coughs> forgive me, Sherry Bryant Hamilton uh, and Jeannie uh, Potter who helped lead the effort uh, for this worthy marker. I uh, want to recognize Jean Henry, who's here with us today with Lawrence, uh, Lawrence not Lawrence Construction, uh, Lawrence and Associates. Um, one of our goals for this project was to uh, have women lead it, uh, a woman-owned business uh, who actually came out and um, uh, installed the marker uh, along with Kentucky DOT, uh, so that was pretty special as well. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say is um, I just want to thank everyone, including I see um, people out here who have uh, influenced my life and influenced the life of the rest of the community, um, especially the white community. Um, I, I've learned more in the last three years um, about courageous women, uh, smart women, hardworking um, from all walks of life, um, who dedicated themselves to making their community and their lives better. Um, and so um, Nanny Helen Burroughs was just one of them. Uh, we are honored to be a part of that. Uh, and it's just a reminder that I learned about women for the past 200 years that were not in my history books, ever, ever, and would not be in my mind and my own new history had it not been for the efforts of some of the women uh, out here who've been, who've been working, including Sherry and Sherry's mother, uh, Carol Mattingly, um, you know, uh, others out here. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity. To Sherry Bryan Hamilton, that was an extraordinary recounting about your mom and your family's history. and. We don't get to do that very often in life, so thank you very much for sharing that with us. So I'm honored to be here today to celebrate with you all the life and legacy of Nanny Helen Burroughs. Obviously, as we know in her hearing, she was an amazing woman who not only left her mark on Louisville, but on our nation as well. And it's only fitting that we're going to honor her with this historic marker to keep her legacy alive for too long. The stories of great American patriots like Nanny didn't receive the recognition that they deserved. And I believe it's our job and our honor to change that. So much of our nation's challenges today lie in the fact that our full history is not being told to us. Our 400 plus year history 
And I believe that if in fact it was, our country would be a very different place. And it's my hope that we will integrate these stories into the telling of the history of our city, especially for our young people here. This is an integral part of the fight for racial equity that's taking place, not just in our city, but in cities all over America right now that was fueled by the protest of 2020 and the brave people that took to the streets to call out injustice. They, people like Nanny, will undoubtedly inspire people. It might be a young person, it might be a young black girl. When they look at a picture like this, and I don't know what you see in her face, but I see no nonsense. I see determination. I see somebody that's going to call out injustice and take care of business. She will inspire generations of young people for years and years to come, and that's why it's so important that we hold up heroes like Nanny. Nanny's contribution to our history took many forms. Civil rights pioneer, educator, feminist, suffragist, orator, religious leader, and entrepreneur. She fought for equality. When it wasn't easy, it's not easy now. She fought for equality for black people and for women, and we all owe, all owe this amazing American a great debt. More than just giving advice and teaching, Nanny was a problem solver, and I love this. She often spoke about the importance, Barbara, of taking action. Not just moving the lips, but getting things done as well. And like us, she believed that compassion was an action word the work we do to help others reach their full human potential. While in Louisville, she founded the Women's Industrial Club at this location, which was a catalyst for her eventual career in education. And we know that education, that opportunity, goes through the classroom. Classrooms like the Grace James Academy, the Du Bois Academy, Central High School, and then, of course, our city's great HBCU, Simmons College. So I'm excited that this important moment in place in our history are commemorated here today. And not only are these voter suppression efforts taking place, they are winning. She wouldn't have put up with that, and neither should we. And that should be a call for everybody to take action and fight this at every opportunity. Just like we must fight efforts for those that discount, minimize, or ignore the extraordinarily important year of 1619 in the history of our country. But when enough people say the same mistruths enough time, people start to believe that. And so it's another example of why injustice presents itself. Those that seek justice must speak and must speak loudly. And that's the least we can do to honor Nanny here today. So special thanks to former Councilwoman Sherry Bryan Hamilton, Tina Ward Pugh, our city's office for women director who's doing an incredible job. Thank you for all the things that you've done for us, Tina, leading that office. I'd like to recognize Barbara Sexton Smith who's with us here today. Great job as a former councilwoman for our city. And we're also grateful for the Kentucky Historical Society and the Kentucky Historical Marker Program for providing this prominent way to recognize and share the sites, events, and personalities that are so important to our history. First of all, about Sherry Bryan Hamilton, a walking, talking reservoir of black history and wisdom. I was asked by the trustees at Simmons to name the persons who will be awarded an honorary doctorate from Simmons this year during our July commencement. And I think I know one of the names that I'm going to submit to the Board of Trustees, and that is Sherry Bryan Hamilton. And you deserve that. You're a phenomenal community leader. Why is history so important? Number one, we study history to learn history's lessons. You will never understand why we are here 
today if you don't know what preceded us. That is why whenever you go to the doctor, if it's a new doctor, the doctor will always ask you something about your mother and father. They will say, tell me something about your, your parents. Because as Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot escape history. You are who you are as a person. Your hair texture, your fingerprints, your eye prints, your size, because of your parents transmitting to you their DNA. And we are who we are as a city, as a state, as a nation, because of the social DNA that we have inherited from decisions that were made in the past. You cannot escape history. You study history, number one, to learn history's lessons. Secondly, we study history to be inspired by history's heroes and sheroes. We cannot study a woman like Nanny Helen Burroughs and Mamie Stewart and Virginia Cook and not be inspired by their indomitable spirit, their unconquerable spirit to achieve against extraordinary odds. I mean, if they fought lions and won, surely we can win fighting stuffed animals. We get inspired by their accomplishments. And then thirdly, we study history in order to repair its injustices. And there are a lot of injustices that history has fostered upon us that needs to be repaired. When you talk about Nanny Helen Burroughs, Nanny Helen Burroughs, go to Washington, D.C., the Progressive National Baptist Convention, which is the convention that Martin Luther King started in 1961. Their, their matron saint, the matron saint of the Progressive National Baptist Convention is Nanny Helen Burroughs. Their headquarters is on Nanny Helen Burroughs Boulevard. And she basically got her start here in Louisville, Kentucky. In fact, when you read the profile on her, there's a school that says Eckstein Norton. There's only one school that gave her this brilliant educator and, and an honorary degree. That's Eckstein Norton, which was an extension of Simmons College that was right there in Bullitt County. Eckstein Norton, the great nanny Helen Burroughs. Now, if you want to know the significance of nanny Helen Burroughs on a very practical level, especially if you are part of the black church tradition, here it is. Sunday we celebrated Mother's Day. Mother's Day was started by a woman named Ann Jarvis. She started Mother's Day to honor mothers who were overworked and underappreciated. Ann Jarvis would later spend the rest of her life trying to dismantle women Mother's Day because of the commercialization of the day. But what Ann Jarvis was to Women's Day, Nanny Helen Burroughs is to a special day in the black church. She is the founder of the one day in which black churches are able to catch up with their bills. And that is called Women's Day. Every church in the United States, if you are a black church, has Women's Day. And guess where the idea for Women's Day got started? Right here in Louisville, Kentucky, because of Nanny Ellen Rose. Let's pull it on. Three, two, one.